Welcome to Hello Self. It's a podcast focused on turning your cans into cans and your dreams into plans. I am your host, coach, and author, Patricia Leonard. To all of my Hello Self listeners, I'm so excited that you're here today and you're going to be excited after you hear this podcast with my guest. She is fabulous. Now, remember, this podcast is about turning your cans into cans. So while you're listening, I want you to think about how do I feel about that? What are things, some things that I could do? If you've said to yourself, I couldn't do what my guest does or what Patricia does. I don't want you to go away with that. Think about what you can do because every one of us are having hello self moments and we either act on them and make plans and put them in place or we don't. So that's the purpose of this podcast is to give you some ideas from stories told by my guest and you're going to be in for a treat today. I've got a guest that I met at a performance, but wait till you hear her bio. You're going to be really interested in the Hello Self journeys that she has made. My guest today, and I just wanted to say hello, and then I'm going to do a brief bio about her, and then I'm going to turn it over to her to take us on her journey of life and career, whatever she has to say. So Irma... Arara is here and she is my guest and I'd just like for you to say hello to the Hello Self audience, Irma. Hello, Patricia, and hello, listeners. I'm very pleased to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me. Sure. Are you kidding? Thank you for being here. We've got stories to tell. And Irma, one thing that I always tell my audience is that I believe in every story, there are many gifts and lots of glories. So your story that you tell today, and then the one that you tell in your performance, is going to have an impact on somebody. We go to movies, we read books, we do all these things to learn and to see other sides of the world. So that's exactly what this podcast is about, is to help our listeners, and thank you for doing that, to understand that there's more to life than what we see a lot of times, and we all learn about that when we listen to others. Okay, so now the old bio, the whole bio on in a really short version, because I'm going to let Irma take it from there once I give her give you a little understanding. Irma Herrera is from San Francisco Bay Area, and she's a writer and solo performer. How I met her, and she'll tell you more about this, is her solo performance of Why Would I Mispronounce My Own Name? And she explores themes of identity. Before doing all of her writing and becoming a performer, she was still a performer in some ways, she spent 30 years, three decades, as a civil rights lawyer. She worked on issues that you hear on the television or radio about what's going on in the news. She has worked as a journalist and has written about race, class, gender, and culture. Her articles have appeared in New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Lawyer, and Ms. Magazine. I'm really interested in that too. (laughs) She is a recipient of several awards, and I'll let her tell some of those, but I just wanted to give a highlight. But one thing that really caught my eye when I read her bio Irma is a graduate of St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas, and listen to this, the University of Notre Dame Law School. I am from Indiana, and I went to so many of their football games, freezing cold too. Okay, so sit back and enjoy the story and the journey with Irma. And we'll have a conversation. I may butt in. You know how I always do. Every once in a while, I'll have something to interject 
and Irma will have a con and I will have a conversation about it. Irma, take it from here and just tell us whatever your story is. You're a performer. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. As you mentioned, we met in Nashville, Tennessee in February. Yes. I am a solo performer and playwright of a play called Why Would I Mispronounce My Own Name? When people see my name in writing, I-R-M-A, they often say Irma. And that is one pronunciation of this name. But my name is Irma, which is the pronunciation not just in Spanish. It's French, Italian, Russian, wow. Danish. In many countries, the name is pronounced Irma. So often when I introduce myself, I have to explain to people that I'm not Irma, it's Irma. And that may or may not open a further conversation about my ethnic identity. I'm Mexican-American, Chicana. I grew up in a certain political age where that's the identity I chose. And as you mentioned, I grew up in South Texas. I left in my late teens, early 20s, and I've lived in other places. I did go to law school in South Bend, Indiana. Yay! And <laughs> I often recommend to people that they go live somewhere different than where they grew up because you learn so much about yourself, being around people in different communities. When I grew up in South Texas, it was a very segregated community of Mexican-Americans and Anglos, what we called white people. And there were a handful of Black families, but I didn't meet them till high school because of segregation. When I got to Notre Dame, I just assumed all white people were Anglos, the word we use for them. And a friend of mine who was a fellow student said, Anglo? I'm Irish. I'm from an <laughs> Irish-American family. We're not Anglos. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know. So we're all learning along the way. I also learned that there's people who are Jewish, who are Polish, who are yes. Armenian. And I didn't know about Muslims, but my son as a young boy already knew that because he went to a school in Berkeley, California with kids from many backgrounds. And so we're always learning, but I became an accidental playwright. I did I not did. have a background in theater or acting, but I was taking a class I had been writing a novel after I left law. I was I left law about 12 years ago. I spent almost all of my career in social justice, civil rights lawyering, initially advocating on behalf of Mexican Americans and the Latino community. And then I worked as a journalist for a few years. And my first aha moment that I want to talk or hello self moment I want yeah. to talk about is I was working at the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund in San Francisco on cases involving children whose primary language was not English. And we were in a lawsuit in the Denver School District and the judge issued a ruling in favor of our clients that the schools had to provide children accessible education, meaning teaching them in a language they understood, in this case, Spanish, while they're learning English. That was one way of making an educational system fair to these children. Exactly. And the newspaper the following day after the judge's ruling said, these out-of-town lawyers that are holding back children, they don't want them to learn English and on. And I just, they, there's a complete misunderstanding uh -huh. about the work that we're doing. And why would you want a kid to sit in a classroom and not understand the instruction Dos y dos son cuatro. Two and two is four. If you already know the language, you can start learning concepts in your own language so that you're not getting so far behind Absolutely. as learning English. Absolutely. And incidentally, I send our son to a bilingual French school. And there, there was no judgment about children learning French and English. And I think it's wonderful. I am a bilingual person and I love that I know more than two languages. I It makes me able to communicate with a wider world. It helps me to understand people's backgrounds and culture a little better by speaking that language. So I felt this frustration about how the broader public was getting a vision or a version of our work that was inaccurate. So I came back to the office, our office was in San Francisco, and I spoke to the person who leads the media for our organization. And she said, why don't you write an article about it and I'll try and get it placed in a newspaper. I wow. said, okay. 
So I wrote an article and it got placed in the New York Times as an opinion piece. And so that was the first thing I ever published, which is pretty unusual that your yes. first writing you get published. But it was because I had some authority. I was a lawyer who was working on these kinds of cases. And so then I thought, I love to write and I would like a broader public to know more about my community and the goals we have as a people. We're just like anybody else. And the Latino communi community, which has grown very significantly in the United States, has many people from different countries. But I'm of Mexican-American origin, and Mexican-Americans have lived in the Southwest for hundreds of years before it was the United States. So many of us, we're not really foreigners to this country. We have long historical roots that predate the arrival of the Mayflower or the movement of people to the West Coast or the Southwest from the Eastern Seaboard. So in my play, I incorporate all these things. I feel a need and desire to give historical context about my community to, to dispel so much of the myth that we hear, especially today that casts Latinos as a whole mass of people right. who are undesirables, who don't belong in this country. Guess what? We've been here a very long time and we're not going anywhere. And we contribute in many different ways to this country. But for the most part, if you have not grown up in a community where you've had interactions mm -hmm. with the Latino community, you're simply, you don't know about this community and its historical roots or why they're coming to this country, those who are arriving more recently or in the past decades. But there's been a long history of people coming and going from the Americas because the America is more than the United States, although right. we use that term pretty much to mean the U.S. Mexico and Central America are all part of North America, or actually Mexico is part of North America, then we have Central and South America. So my play seeks to tell stories about my community and then my own story and my own experiences with both success and barriers to success mm -hmm. because of discrimination and assumptions that people make about anyone who is an ethnic or racial minority mm -hmm. in this country. And a lot of people say, I don't see color. I don't treat anybody differently. Everybody sees color. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you don't see you me, know, uh, you don't see me. I uh, remember you saying that in your show and that that you are right on because the first thing that we notice about somebody is the image, the image. We make judgments about the clothing they wear. We make judgments about the titles they have. Not just Americans, as in general, we put people up on a pedestal because of that, some title or whatever, or the house they live in or whatever. And one of the things that I really like about what you're doing is that it's bringing us all together to understand so we let go of those judgments. And an another thing you said that, and I want my audience to understand this, if you don't get outside the little 20 mile community you live in, you're going to hold on to these biases. You just don't know that you have them because one of the things with hello self podcast i have said to myself i want to say hello self to how i feel about it. and i've got all kinds of diversity on here and i don't mean diversity just in color or culture or language people who think different people who i like that it really challenges me to be better and just like Irma's saying, it makes us a better world because we quit judging and we start stopping and getting to know the person inside. I remember when my son graduated from college, and this is a true story. He graduated from a college in Indiana. <clears throat> and I had we and we had always lived in Columbus, Indiana. And I said, Greer, first of all, he took languages when he was in college. And then his first trip was to Guatemala on a college outing, seven days. 
But anyway, he learned a lot just from that. But anyway, I remember when he graduated from college, I said, Greer, I want you to get out of Columbus, Indiana. You'll just, and I shouldn't say this in a negative way, but you'll just follow what everybody else is doing. You'll have babies and you'll never discover who you are. And it doesn't mean having babies stops that, but you get complacent. And I said, so go find out who you are before you decide all that. So Greer went out to California with five women. They had a trail of enterprise trucks and they all went out there and he and another one who had been in high school, they lived together. Let me tell you, this was a learning for both of them, first of all, to get to California. And then secondly, uh, he, he, the young lady's mother had been a counselor in high school and said, I don't want her to go out there by herself, but Greer wants to go to California, I know. But the, the theme here is that Greer and these five women went out there, they dropped one off in Arizona. But guess what I did? I said, Patricia, you don't know who you are either. You've lived here all your life. I sold, and some would say a designer home. It was a nice, but I sold it and moved to Nashville, put everything in storage. I didn't know anybody. I came down here and walked the streets. Yeah, I got called a street walker just for fun, but walked the streets and meeting people on the street and in the stores because I wanted to find out who I was. Unless we have been outside our own environment or gone to something like Irma's show, which tells us, and then she's got more about what her show, the real part of it that really came out to help educate. Unless we do that, we get caught in a comfort zone of this is what the world is and we don't know how to interact with others. I would say a lot of our world is there right now. So Irma, sorry, but that is, I had to say that get out of where you live, even if it's just going on a vacation or doing something different, walking in a small town where you don't know anybody and taking your little phone and making, oh my gosh, I love where what you're taking us to. <laughs> and I know there's more to come even about what your show did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> pick it up from there. Cause I'm going to blab on. <laughs> I love what you're saying about go somewhere else. And it doesn't have to be a physical move because I have friends no. who still live in the city where we grew up and they have really good lives. You can expose yourself to a different world through books, through movies, yes. through travel, many, many ways. And as a little girl, I was an avid reader and I felt that I traveled the world through books and I got to see the lives of other people through the written word. And then it gave me a real desire to travel and to want to see the world and to speak languages beyond Spanish and yes. English. And a lot of that desire came from the exploration I had done through books. So we're not all lucky that we get to move away or do extensive travel. But today with the internet, my goodness, you can see places for free and travelogues. You, it's my Technology mind has exploding changed. exploding sometimes. Yeah. Yes. So anyway, I did go to law school. I became a lawyer. It was very rewarding work. I left law and worked as a journalism, writing about culture, writing about class, writing about, for example, I was noticing, I lived at that time in San Francisco proper. I now live about 14 miles outside of San Francisco. I lived in the Mission, which is a very Latino neighborhood at that time. It's now much more gentrified, but I would see billboards selling products in Spanish, Tomes, Anheuser-Busch or whatever, and yet, at the same time, there was a proposition to make Spanish the or English the official language of the United States. People who would speak Spanish in the street would be overheard by other people and rude things would be told yeah. to speak English, this is America or whatnot, or go back to your own country. And I just found that so interesting. The fact that the business sector recognized where our country was moving, that we had a changing demographic, yes. that they wanted customer bases to feel more included. At the same time, there was this resistance from people who were afraid of change. And I think that we need to make peace with change is the only thing that's a constant. 
Our communities have always been changing. When there was a huge migration of Irish and Germans in the late 1800s, early 1900s, people who were already set here said, those people will never fit in. They're not like us. Mm -hmm. There was bilingual education in German, in Swedish, in all sorts of things. So people from different countries bring their own cultures and they get incorporated into the United States. Who doesn't love burritos, enchiladas, taquitos? The first place we get introduced to a new community is through food. Yes, and then, that's true. And then people make friends. Our kids have a really much easier time making friends with other kids. And one of the things I was listening to your podcast, you interviewed a woman who spoke about a book she wrote about her elderly dog. And she talks about using the dog as a way when she reads to children yeah. of having this dog is older, but it has other dog friends who are younger, who are different. Yes. Who, and it's a way of kids are much more accepting of each other and they learn oh, from yes. each other how their foods might be different. They might dress different. They look different. But as adults, we tend to be much more uh, comfortable with people who look like us, who are from our social class, who are from our community, have similar backgrounds. But we learn so much from people who are different from ourselves if we give the opportunity to know them. And you talked about stories and your podcast is about stories. One of my favorite quotes is the closest distance between two people is a story. Oh, and it's wow. not my quote. It's a woman named Patty Dye, who's an educator about race and culture. I love uh, she that. Lives somewhere in the South, but I think that's just such a beautiful quote. Yes. The closest distance between two people is a story. You can give me all these statistics about this or that. But tell me a story about someone who's had an experience that those statistics represent, and that will get my attention. That will touch me in an emotional way. And that's what we need to do, be connected to people and hear their stories so that we have a better understanding of who they are. Irma, that is why your play is so impactful, because it's not a lecture it's a story. Although and sometimes I'm told it, it it ventures into the lectury part because that's the lawyer in me coming out. So my director is always saying, no, too many words, too many words. Yeah, I do think sometimes that's how people hear things too, because especially if you're touching somebody's value system or the cultural beliefs they have, they're going to feel that's a lecture and not a story. So sometimes they have to look back at, and you tell your director, I said, <laughs> they have to look back at themselves too and say, uh, it's simply your story. Uh, and it doesn't mean that everybody has to agree with it, but it's another way that we integrate our society is, do we always have to be resistant to what's coming to us or can we find something in it um, that, Oh, this sounds like a lecture. Maybe you better look at yourself <laughs> and see how you're receiving that because I know I am a biased kind of person just about thoughts and stuff like that and the way we I see We all them. have biases. Yes. <laughs> there is no such thing as being unbiased. We have positive biases and negative biases. Yes. And the whole point of going through life is trying to figure out what do I think about that? How do I feel about that? Yes. And sometimes what we think and feel is not so okay. One of my favorite bumper stickers is, oh my goodness, I just blanked out on what it says. Don't believe everything you think. <laughs> See, that's perfect for what we're talking about. Don't this believe exactly everything right. you think. We think certain things because we've been taught that by our parents, our friends, and then all of a sudden you have an experience that makes you think realize that's not true. Irma, you're reminding me something. And I think every parent goes through this. Your kids will say, stop lecturing me. And then about 20 years down the road, they've got a little child and you hear them 
Now, this is something, so <laughs> they're doing this, they're taking everything that mama said to them. Oh, that was a lecture then, but now it's a guidance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, I've heard people say, when did I start sounding like my mother? Exactly. <laughs> and when we first became parents, I listened to these tapes called Don't Blame the Kids. <laughs> and it, was, it talked about how we often say nobody taught us how to parent. There's no, and they said, it's not true. You have tens of thousands of hours of parenting information. It came from your parents. Right. So the default for that. how we parent is how we were parented. Exactly. And it's the same thing for what we know and experience about the world came through our family. Yes. I remember one day I was living in Eastern Washington and I'm driving over the Cascade Mountains to Seattle to visit friends. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, I'm in my mid twenties, late twenties. I'm driving over a mountain range. I'm going from one place to another all by myself. And I had a mother who had many fears. Yes. And I, sometimes people are surprised to learn that I have a lot of fears but I still act. I still yes. do things. So people say, aren't you scared of doing this or that? And it's, yeah, I Thank am. you for sharing that. That's one of the best things that you can give my audience is feel the fear and do it anyway. Yeah. And there are lots of things that are scary. I had an incident where my car wouldn't start a couple of weeks ago and I was in a hurry. I had to go somewhere. I was leaving for another city the next day. My husband came and waited for three hours with AAA. And then they said, oh, this is all you need to do. It's not a big problem. Oh. Yesterday, I'm in my car and my car does the same thing in San Francisco. Oh, wow. And I'm thinking, my car won't start and I need to get to a meeting. I also need to go across a bridge to get back home this evening. And I was overcome with fear. I think, mm -hmm. oh my God, what if my car doesn't start? I'm going to have to take the subway back home, which is fine. But then my car is going to be parked in the street. What if it gets broken into? What I All these yes. what if started coming up. And yeah. I, was a nerve, I was nervous and anxious. And then I thought, okay, calm down. Yes. Give it a few minutes. Try what worked last time to get the car started, which was putting the fob right by the start button. <laughs> and then it started, right? But now I'm a, now I'm afraid of driving my car, right? But I am going to get that taken care of so that yes. I don't live with that fear. But yes, we all have a lot of fears. And what do you do about your fears? Maybe you need to talk to a therapist. Nothing wrong with going to therapy. Exactly. And or do you listen, need, need to listen to Irma's story on podcast again and again. <laughs> so feel the fear, but do it anyway. Exactly. And maybe even make a list of what are, what is the worst thing that could happen. And then it's okay. I can deal with that. I can deal with that. I've listened to some of your other podcast guests, and you do have such great things to share with people about practical application to one's life. And all of us have fears, all of us have doubts, all of us have failed, however that's defined, at something or other that we've done. And then we've moved on and done something better yeah. or different. You might think because Irma is a an attorney, she's got all kinds of awards, she gets out and performs. She just shared with you that she has to push through those because those are things that we all face. And I think the more we realize that it's not unique to us, because remember, in every story, there are lots of gifts. And she's just sat here and given you several stories about different cultures and the way we think and the fact that we are biased and just admitting some of those things and how we can open the door simply by saying, I'm scared to death. What am I going to do? Okay, let me walk with you. Let me help you. What do you, yeah, you can go to a therapist. You can go to a friend. Yes. Uh, surround Absolutely. yourself with people. Yes. Absolutely. A friend who will say, like a friend maybe who's really struggling in their career with yeah. a job. And it's what's not working for you. What is it you want? Let's brainstorm together. Yes. Write down what, what is good about your present position. 
what would you like to be different? Is there a way that you can make it different where you are now? And if there isn't, maybe it is time to go do something else or do the same thing at a different organization or as a freelancer or as a whatever. But we often feel very stuck because it is scary to be in a place where you're not feeling satisfied with your life. That's why we have friends and other resources. I cannot underestimate the value of our friendships. And yes. my women friends are just such a gift to me. And I use them as a sounding board. I'm there for them. They're there for me. So even if we're very busy with our jobs, we're busy, especially when you, when we're younger and we're in a new relationship with a romantic partner, it's often the case that young people will neglect their network of friends. Yes. Keep space for your friends and be cautious of any romantic partner who seeks to separate you away from your friends. Great, great advice. Great advice. Because our friends are such a great resource to us and they're the start of our network. A lot, I've heard people speak in your podcast about networks. Networks come in many shapes and it's people that we know whom we've taken an interest in, who've taken an interest in us. And I'm a big believer in generosity and helping people with introductions. I love mentoring and meet young people who are thinking Very about important. going to law, about being journalists, even if they're just thinking about what do I do after high school? Yes. I love hearing what are their dreams. I also tell people, you may not end up doing what you think you want to do. And especially today, people have multiple careers throughout their lifetimes. Used to be people became a lawyer and you did that forever. Turn on your television and on any network, many of the anchors, many of the reporters, they're lawyers. Yes. You'll yeah, isn't it interesting? I bet some of you out there even have your attitudes about lawyers. How do you, what kind of attitudes do you have now about listening to this lawyer? She's just an ordinary kind of person with goals to help others, to mentor others. Don't be afraid to reach out. CEOs of companies just have a title. Irma has a title. She is a human being first. And she has lived some life. She's out there trying things. She's shared what... These are the things that you face every day when you get up and say, I want to do this. But I don't know. I, if I that's do. a great example. Using lawyers and how... And our biases. Lawyers often have a bad name because mm -hmm. there are some people who are such jerks yes. who happen to be lawyers and yes. we see them in the news and we see them in television programs and in the movies. And you think, my God, what a duplicitous, unpleasant, <laughs> unethical person who's trying to get something that is not fair. And we look at that person and we think, oh man, those lawyers, they're all such jerks. But that's not true of everyone, right? Yes, it's, and it's I love it. A small group of people, but a lot of people have a built-in bias against lawyers because of that. So you have to take people at face value All and right. see what they are like. The ethnicity, the language they speak, the titles they wear. That they're human beings at the core, and I would challenge all of you listening. To If you want to talk to somebody, don't be afraid to talk to them. I think Irma and I were talking before about her name and how they pronounce it. One thing I think that you can really build strong relationships with is ask, am I pronouncing? I want to honor your parents and I want to honor you by speaking your name correctly. And that was one of the first things we did when we got on here today. I want to make sure that I am saying your name right, because that's another way that you can honor people is recognizing their, you may have read a book about ethnicity, or you may have met somebody and you just love them and they're from another country and you guys are learning how to relate. So I think, I wish that in our society today, there could be more of the relationships that Irma and I are developing because the more I know her, the more I love her and respect 
what she is doing to help influence our society's thinking and maybe even unknown thinking about what biases they have or what they're thinking about and what they're afraid of, because I think that's the 90% of it is what they're afraid of. Irma, I want to ask one thing, and if you don't want to talk about that, that's okay, but what is your feeling, because you're, you're looking at the world from a lawyer standpoint, from an ethnicity, from a culture, from being in a culture that you had to adapt in other words, to basically what it was. So we have a lot of people coming in now from other countries. And I am not asking you to do a political kind of thing. I'm simply asking you, how do you feel? What are we doing to with the border? What, what advantage, what is that doing to the way people feel about other cultures and the way they treat other cultures. And I'm not saying get in a political kind of thing, because that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the human race. And is something like this unfair? I just had a tree fall in my, <clears throat> over this bad storm we had the other day. And I had two Mexicans that came and helped me cut that tree up. We had the best conversations, and they speak English too, but one spoke a little, but I had the best conversation, and I went out and said, are you guys thirsty? No, we got our water. So a little while later, I went out, and I said, you guys haven't eaten anything since you got here, and so I took them some a package of mixed nuts, and then about four o'clock, I said, you guys still haven't eaten. Do you want something? maybe a sandwich. And so I fixed them chicken. I said, is chicken salad okay? I don't have anything else right now. And they said, that's perfect. They sat down for a couple of minutes and ate that chicken salad sandwich. And I told them I'm having one too. Uh, and we had the best time. The I just guess I don't understand. Now, I don't know if they're legal or illegal. I don't know. I didn't say you got to sign this piece of paper. I want, I valued them for what they were helping me do and I paid them. Oh, they got paid. So how do you feel about just your own gut feel without politics or anything, the value or the not value? <laughs> I don't know what that is. Yeah, I feel that what's going on in the border is very sad and unfortunate that I know. people who are trying to come to the United States are fleeing terrible conditions in their own country. There's all kinds of bad things happening as a result of some of it is related to climate change. Some of it is related to territorial wars within their own countries having Absolutely. to do with drugs and whatnot, much of the drugs that come to the U.S., and a lot of people are fleeing extreme violence and they're looking for better lives. Do you think any parent would put an unaccompanied 13 year old to make a 3000 mile trip if they didn't think that was their only chance for their child to survive? So our nation needs a comprehensive immigration policy, but because our Congress, our elected officials are so divided and so antagonistic to each other, we're unable to address and come up with a policy that's fair and that works. We have laws that should allow people to apply for asylum, to do all these other things that simply aren't working. So we've created this mm. crisis, if you will, yeah. with people living in encampments in the border. And I know that a lot of people say, well, what about the people we have at home live, living in homeless encampments as well? We need to address all those things. And I think that our nation has so many resources yeah. that we could deploy in a different way. Right now, we're seeing this banking crisis. And I was reading Robert Reich, who used to be the Secretary of Labor, saying that the Silicon Valley Bank, the U.S. government has come in and bailed out billionaires who have money there, but we don't bail out other people with providing an adequate safety net. My own political view is that I am someone who's considered very liberal, very progressive. I believe that our country 
has the resources, and that part of a society's obligation is to provide a safety net for the vulnerable people. If we were to educate people, if we were to give more economic opportunities, we wouldn't see some of the chaos and suffering that we are seeing on the streets every day in our country. And that's unfortunate. You know, this, and it's uh, only this, when you can go, for example, if you've had the opportunity to travel in other countries and you see how their systems work and you can say, okay, we're not Denmark, but I've been to Denmark several times and I've gone on a bike tour with the same guy who leads bike tours. And he says, we are very proud of our welfare system. Imagine anyone in this country saying that. It's because we take care of people in need. And he pointed out, he said, see this building over there? He said, that's social housing. That's housing for low-income people. Right across the street, building the apartments in that building sell for four and five million dollars. He said, we don't separate our poor and rich people. Their kids go to the same schools. We don't believe in creating a stratified society. It's true, they're much more homogeneous, they're smaller, but it's about the values a society makes about who they want to be as a country. And I think in our country, we are going in a direction where we're really seeing them and us. And we, us, those people who are more privileged, better educated, or even not. I feel for people in Rust Belt cities in yes. Appalachia that are struggling to get jobs because yes. their economies have been devastated. But the goal shouldn't be to pit them against another group of people, but to say, how do we as a society bring the resources you need to your community that no longer can sustain coal mining or manufacturing of this or that product because that work has gone abroad and that work has gone abroad because we have an insatiable desire for cheap consumer goods and right. businesses will look for the cheapest way so that to produce something so they can maximize profit the you know, whole people... thing is it's about money and power and i think you're even saying that too it yes. ends up being about money and power and you're right when we get to the upper level, like in Kong, not that you're right, I'm saying that's how I see it too, is that when we get to that level, all of those people are very wealthy. And I, it just doesn't seem right. I came up in a rural area, very poor. I didn't use that. I didn't become a victim to do that. I went ahead. But what I've learned and what I keep wanting to learn is the opinions of others because sometimes I, I get all confused, Irma, about how I feel about stuff. Like some coming across the border, how I feel about that when somebody I know, their son dies of fentanyl. And I, and I, so I get confused, but again, it goes to our policies. I think you mentioned that our policies of immigration need to be managed and not just helter skelter because that'll never ever work. It doesn't seem. And then it goes back to the children, the public, the education. And I just heard that unions are they don't want to teach because they're not making money. It's all, you're, oh my goodness. Yeah. I get all confused. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I don't want us to, to union, to demonize unions. They've played a very important role in creating rights that workers have in this country. And it does provide protection and better pay and better opportunities. What's going on in education is very challenging. We're asking teachers to do more and more. We have under-resourced schools that aren't getting enough money. We're asking exactly. principals to be in a classroom. Yeah. And so the teachers are trying to advocate for themselves and their vehicle for advocating is the union. And oftentimes it is the only way, as in many workplaces, where we will improve the work conditions, Yes, our public servants or whatever industry they may be in. And I know there's been big unionization efforts at Amazon. Amazon is making a lot of money. It should be able to pay its employees more fairly. 
and to not expect them to work at such a rate that you have a disproportionate number of injuries of people at the work. So a union is an equalizer on behalf of the worker. Right. But yes, we have so many societal problems that are in need of addressing in a way that is thoughtful and fair and considerate. Yes. <clears throat> we need to be more equitable in how we distribute resources in this country. And it needs to be people to me that's common sense people like you and I, instead of somebody that is just looking at one side of things and making, yeah, making judgments. And I hear you when you say sometimes you're confused. You don't know what to yes, think I about am. all these things that are going on. And that happens to all of us. And it's when it's good to hear something outside of your own comfort yes. zone. We've become so habituated to listening to just the news that confirms our <laughs> own view of the world. Yes. And so then you have people in these two camps that never talk to each other or listen to each other. And that's, that's again about good. the power, isn't it? That's it's not a, good. Yeah. Because that's power. They're trying to get the power by do yeah. Oh my goodness. I know my brother and I, my brothers and I both talk about this. Because we try to keep each other level-headed to say, what do you think about it, Rick? What do you think about it, Mike? So that we can get other opinions besides just our own. And we're all challenging in my family. You can tell that. <laughs> yeah, so we... Remember, uh, don't believe everything you think. Exactly. Yeah, and that's exactly how we go. I don't see it like this. How do you see it then if it's not? Because I think I've got it all figured out and then they see it another way. Yeah. But but it's through conversations like that. And I am thank you for sharing your thoughts about that, because, again, there will be some people that will say, yeah, she's biased and that she's this. And yes, we agree. We are on certain things. We all are. But I think it just to have a conversation about yes. culture, to have a conversation about schools, to have a conversation about power and ego, to have a con just a generic conceptual view of the world is so refreshing. And that's what I love about your show and the work you do. I'm looking forward to more opportunities to connect with you. Thank uh, you. Yeah. And th I want to thank you today. But before we close out, what would be one piece of advice that you would give to my listeners specifically about viewing the world or finding more confidence in them? Anything, just anything that you say, I'd like to share this in my closing thoughts. I think it's really important to be kind to people mm. and to assume the best in others. Sometimes I'm in the car and someone will cut me off. And my first inclination is to say an ugly word or two. And, oh then, I think, and then I think to myself, I don't know if that person is late to a job interview that's really important and they need that job. So go in peace. Right? So I often find that when I extend grace to another person, it's so helpful to me. So to, <laughs> to approach life from a place of generosity to others, and you're going to be people who are jerks and who it's like, okay, fine. But don't start out with the assumption that <laughs> someone else is you know what you're telling oh this is right on because I was listening to Joel Osteen one time on television and I remember he was telling a story on himself and he said I was late for a meeting my fault he said but I got in traffic and I thought I cannot believe this I this traffic is lined up I'm never going to make it to now he was blaming the traffic <laughs> and hurry up oh that woman oh look at her what she did and he was going through all this and he said it's really funny I finally said Joe you get there when you get there so you can get all upset or whatever you want to do but it ain't going to change anything he said guess what happened I got there on time <laughs> I do the same thing and 
I get mad because this person cuts me off and I say, I hope you make it, but not real nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. This is so fabulous. Thank you. How can people get a hold of you, know more about your show and, uh, or anything? Well, I, I write about these issues that we're talking about, about fairness and justice and getting to know about other communities in my newsletter. On my website is just my name, Irma Herrera, I-R-M-A-H-E-R-E-R-A.com. I'm also, if the website is the best place because there you can also link to my social media. Yes. I'm not super, super active, but I do post on Instagram and Facebook. But if you go to my website, which is just my name, IrmaHerrera.com, and there it will also tell you about upcoming shows. I don't have anything booked except for I'm going to be performing at a couple of universities in San Antonio later cool. in this year. But I also perform my play and then lead conversations for law yes. firms, for corporations, for organization conferences. And so the best way to contact me is through my website. Yes. And one of the things, I just want to add one thing. I love that. It will be on, when we post the podcast, it will be there available, the website location. But I want to say one thing that we didn't spend much time on, that Irma has a, she said she had conversations and I get, I go talk to these. She had a conversation at the end of her show and I wanted to, with the audience at TPAC here in Nashville, Tennessee, our Tennessee Performing Arts Theater. And she had a conversation after the show and talked to the audience. It was so powerful. Wouldn't you agree, Irma? I do love speaking with audiences after my show. My show is an hour long and it deals with a lot of issues about identity and judgments we make about people different from yes. ourselves. And it raises many questions in people's minds. And so people have comments and want to share some of their own personal experiences and ask my view about this or that. And I love sharing with the audiences and hearing what they think about these topics that I cover. That is so engaging because I was in there when I went to see her show. I was part of that. And it was just interesting, the diversity in the comments that people made. And it's a way to figure out, hello, self, who am I? Hello, self, what do I think about? How do I believe that? Not only from Irma, but from the people that were there. It was interesting, Tennessee people. I wanted to see how they saw because she was invited here. She, it wasn't like she was pushed to come to Tennessee. She was invited. <laughs> yes. And one of the things I love is hearing from audience members days and weeks after my performance about something that they heard that made them think differently about yes. something they thought they knew. And I'll just give one example. In my play, I talk about the GI Bill. The GI Bill was started after World War II to help all the returning soldiers, giving them opportunities to buy houses with low income loans, go to college, get an education, get free health care through clinics that were established. But these things were not available to all communities equally. For example, all the housing that was built was in segregated white only neighborhoods. So black and brown people couldn't access houses in those communities. It's those houses that have appreciated so much that helped create the great American middle class. It was going to college on the GI Bill for people's grandparents two generations ago that also helped create the great middle class. Mexican Americans, many Asians and Blacks lived in segregation. There was no college for most of those people. So we didn't have the opportunity to create the middle class and all the benefits that have been enjoyed by large numbers of white Americans. Not everybody, of course not. But it's a policy that seems neutral on its face, but it worked in a way that advantaged one group of people and not another. And many folks comment on that specifically saying, I just had never thought about it. And why would you think about it? No. But now you do. 
Yes, so it's a yeah, that's a very good point. It's an awareness raising kind of show about everything, about everything. Just like this podcast today, we've talked about a little bit of everything because I don't have a script. I, whatever comes to me, I just <laughs> <laughs> and it starts with showing respect by learning a person's name. Yes. So when a person tells you their name and it's a name you're not familiar with, it's always okay to ask them, tell me how to pronounce it. Yes. Help me with the pronunciation. What isn't okay is to tell people, can I call you something else? See, I can really relate to that because my first name is Ibby, but I go by Patricia. So people call me Eddie. Abby, <laughs> Debbie, <laughs> and I said, no, you know what? You can just call me Patricia. <laughs> and that is it. Those are true stories because everything legal is E-B-I-E, -E, but everything in my relationship area is Patricia. So I can relate to all of that. And yes, they do ask me, is that the way you pronounce your name? Oh, it's close, but you can just call me Patricia. <laughs> <laughs> and if someone says you can call me something else, that's okay. That's exactly. what you can call them. Um, you get to decide. You, the individual, get to yes. decide how you say your name and what you want to be called. Exactly. And we should be respectful of that. And we can, you're right. And we can not, not in a blaming way, we can just laugh about it and say, oh, just call me Patricia. That's okay. <laughs> and we do, we laugh it off. And it's, but yes, honor people for what the name is they're given. I think that's very important. Unless the two of you make a decision to do something else. Yes. <laughs> like Irma yes. said. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Irma, thank you so much. I could cook. Just keep talking. And I know we <laughs> well, both. Thank you, Patricia. <laughs> and thank you to all your listeners. And I've enjoyed listening to previous podcasts you've had with other folks. And there have been lessons there that I've walked away with. Thank you so much. And I'm hoping that uh, the same thing goes for our audience, that the nuggets that you gave today from your own life experience and from others and from the transitions that you've done at different phases in your life to come, become a little bit of all kinds of career opportunities and see a bigger part of the world and impact. So I'm so grateful. That's what this world is about. And that's what we need now is somebody that says, I don't know how to do it. I'm scared but I'm going to do it anyway, because I think it's going to benefit others too. So thank you. And I just want to say to my audience, thank you for hanging on with us all this time. And I'm hoping that, no, I know that you've walked away with at least one thing, whether you agree with it or not, one thing that will probably click in your mind in a week or so, like Irma had said, and so if you want to contact her at our website, if you want to talk to me about it, that's fine. But take an action on something you want to do because Hello Self is a waking up to who you are, the talents you have, and acknowledging the fears and pushing right through them. So thank you so much for being at Hello Self podcast today again. I'm your host, Patricia Leonard. I don't even know if I said that at the start. <laughs> but if I didn't, I'm saying it now. I'm Patricia Leonard. And just remember, keep dreaming. It's so important. And living your dreams, manifesting them. So until next time, remember, as I said earlier, keep dreaming. Thank you for joining Hello Self today and may it offer insights and inspire you to stay on your runway to success. Like, share, and subscribe. And remember this, keep dreaming.